Welcome to the show. I'm super excited to be uh, interviewing someone I've known since nine, <clears throat> since 1990. 1990. Um, Hanshi Nico Gordo in the Netherlands. Welcome. Thank you for having me. I'm uh, was, uh, very excited to uh, to keep uh, in contact again with you some uh, time ago. And uh, it was nice uh, to hear from you. And uh, with uh, Facebook, yeah, we get in contact with a lot of people from the old days, so to speak. Yes. So let me first ask you, when you were a kid growing up in Netherlands, yeah. did it even occur to you or did you think that you would do martial arts or is it something that you just fell into almost uh, accidentally? Well, uh, as you probably know, in Holland, we have a lot of uh, soccer players, football, we call it. And uh, I was doing that also with my brothers and my friends. And uh, on some day, I have, uh, we have an, an Indonesian friend. We just uh, disappear sometimes. And we were wondering, hey, what is the guy doing? So one day we followed him. And uh, it appears that he uh, was uh, joining the karate class in my place where I lived then, Sutomir. And so we got uh, interested and uh, we asked, hey, that looked nice. Can we participate? And uh, he said, yeah, okay, you can come. So uh, that's how it starts in, well, it was 1970, 71, 50 years ago more. And uh, so we uh, took class and uh, we never left. Now, when you, you have, uh, I think you have several brothers and sisters, but it seems like only three of you, you, if, as far as I know, you, Gerard and Al really got into it. Is it that you all joined when you were little and then only you three stuck with it or you just the three of you started to begin with? Now, we, we started with the three of us at the same time. And also uh, later on, uh, my three sisters uh, also joined. So uh, at one moment, one moment in time, we were with six of us together in the same dojo. So, but uh, later on, uh, uh, we only, the three of us brothers uh, took it further. Okay. And then um, who was your, was this a, this was a Kyokushin dojo or another yes. karate? Okay, Kyokushin. No, Kyokushin. Who who was the uh, sensei there? That was uh, at that moment was uh, Sian Kusain. It was also in a, in a man with uh, uh, Indonesian uh, origin. So there were a lot of uh, Indonesian guys who were mostly uh, flexible, and uh, then the three uh, farmers came in, <laughs> so to speak. And uh, but it was a very nice atmosphere and a good uh, good training, good uh, teacher. We learned a lot of him. How did you go from those early days when it was, you know, first the six of you, then the three of you, to the point where you were you were fighting guys like Michael Thompson, Andy Hug? How did you make, I mean, how did you go from a recreational hobby to being one, you know, fighting the best Kyokushin fighters in the world? What did that look like? Well, it was a, 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 a you know, growing process. Uh, we uh, enjoyed it so much that... Uh, uh, besides the regular training in our hometown, Sutomir, uh, our teacher, Sensei Kusain, invited us, well, you have to come to the big dojo in Den Haag, The Hague. And there there were the, the big guys and the good guys and the champions. And uh, So we joined it also. So we trained a lot, uh, five, six times a, a week. And, and uh, we fought everybody who was willing to fight. And uh, in the progress, we went getting better and better and better. And then I think it was maybe one year, year and a half, uh, we had to fight the Dutch championship. And then I was a uh, champion then. I was, uh, I think, maybe nine, eight Q, I don't know. But uh, yeah, we were, so to speak, uh, guys from the street. So we know how to fight. Only now it was restricted to uh, certain rules, of course, as you understand and you know. But uh, then it grew and uh, yeah, we took part whenever we can. Uh, depends also, uh, of course, about the finance. We go abroad to England to the British Open. 
Uh, as you know, we were a few times in uh, America, fighting New York and Atlanta. So with, uh, with the help of sponsoring, we uh, could uh, enter some competition with uh, some success. Before we get to New York and Atlanta, we'll, we'll get to that later. When you were a kid, when you were 13, 14, 15, training hard, did you also like school? Were you a studious kid? Did you, did you like to go to school? Did you like to learn? Or you were just in school waiting for school to end to go to karate? Or you, you no. like school too? Yeah, I, I did like uh, school. I, uh, I was uh, yeah, a very regular guy with that. It took me uh, uh, effort to learn something, but I, I have a good time at school. Uh, and after school, of course, we go uh, uh, in the early days, we go to play soccer or play outside. And later on, uh, with the regular training in the evenings, uh, we do the karate stuff. When you, so, you know, uh, when you were, obviously, your brother Gerard reached very high heights as a fighter. When, when you were a little kid and you watched your brother, did you say, man, this, this guy is pretty good? Did you did 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 you see then that he had this potential, or you didn't really know until he got older? No, we we uh, we grew up uh, really uh, on the same level because we uh, the difference between us bros is fourteen months, so we uh, just fourteen months in difference. So we grew up in the in dojo and also on school on almost the same level. So it, it went on gradually. Uh, how do you call it? Gradually, yeah, gradually. Yeah, that's the word. So uh, when we train, yeah, we train uh, with each other and uh, with our training mates, which some, some people, uh, pupils are also very well known, you know, like the brothers, uh, we have Muller and Vedel, Michel Vedel, and uh, we have a strong team, but we were one group together at Saturday in the afternoon. And my mother made a big bowl of soup and uh, half of the dojo came eating with our place. So we grew up uh, as a big uh, friend group. So and, 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 and I, I also fought my brother several times in the dojo, of course. Right, of course. Yeah. But also on competition in Holland. So, uh, yeah, and because I am the oldest, I have a little uh, ahead, I think. Right. <laughs> okay. Yeah, no, I, I, that's what I was thinking. You were looking at your little brother thinking he's pretty good, but... Uh, speaking of the team, which I wanted to get to, um, the Dutch team that I think had people like you, your brother, Peter Smith, Michelle Waddell, and others, probably one of the best Kyokushin teams ever. It, is that partially because the the teacher at that dojo was so good to develop these kind of fighters? Or was it other reasons? Yeah, I think that's it. That that part is uh, a big influence uh, become of this group, but also because we know each other, uh, because we live in the same neighborhood. Uh, we have sometimes make a competition in our house, uh, uh, take away the furniture and uh, have our own competition, so to speak. So we are getting used to uh, to fight each other and uh, lift each other to a higher level. And uh, in that time, we were lucky, and also our teacher was lucky to have such a big group of excellent fighters in his own in one dojo. Peter Peter Smith obviously was a phenomenal fighter. What what um what set him apart? What what characteristics did he have that number one made him so good in Kyokushin? And even in Thai boxing, could knock out one of the best Thai boxers in the world in Thai rules and even beat Rob Kamen. I mean, what was what was it about Peter Smith that was so uh, exceptional? Well, I I, um, I think because he's also a guy from the street, uh, he respected everybody, but wasn't afraid for anybody. It's it, funny doesn't matter, it doesn't matter what size you are. If you're two meters on the 20 kilos, it doesn't matter. And he was um, uh, open as a character. But also in his fighting, he was open. He doesn't care about anything. We call him also crazy. Within his face, eh? we are very straight to each other, always been there. And I said, it's a pity that you don't live in our city. But we could, we have 100% uh, real friendship and contact with him. It was uh, a crazy guy, but a good crazy guy. 
When, when I think the, the, the most important thing is that he doesn't give about, I cannot, I don't know if I can use the word. You can say whatever you want. Okay. He doesn't give shit about anyone. He don't you know, care. When he fought the uh, Thai champ, I was thinking of, of course, obviously physical skill comes into play, but his attitude was, I don't care who you are. I don't care who you are. Yeah. I'm just going forward, which yeah. I think, or even finding a lot of people would fight a guy like Rob Kamen and say, man, I'm fighting Rob Kamen. He didn't care. No. He didn't. That mental went a long that, way. That's it. That's it. And it doesn't matter if you're a five-time champion of the world or 15 times champion of the world. You want to fight me? Okay, you fight me. I can I, I, I'll tell you a little anecdote. I was with his teacher, uh, Jan Vleesenbeek, from uh, his uh, dojo. And uh, I was there uh, with my brother. My brother has to fight, and uh, he also had to fight. And he was sitting there in the, the dressing room waiting for the fight. And he was smoking a cigarette and drink a little beer. He don't care. I said, I killed him all. <laughs> that, that says a lot. Um, so at some point, you know, years are going by, you have a dojo, you're having you and your brothers and your team are having excellent success. Um, at some point, you leave Kyokushin. At some point, how did that, when did it even go in your head? Or maybe we leave Kyokushin. How did this even happen? Well, I, I didn't leave really Kyokushin because I do it, it until the, this moment. Right. But I was uh, very disappointed about uh, after the world championship. In 1987, and there I saw the the how you call it the, the referees and the, the organization. They were so fucking corrupt, and I think everybody is working hard. Everybody's training. Everybody has to 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 give themselves hundred percent financially, uh, mentally, physically, and then on that moment you're getting fucked by some stupid people. So at that moment I said, well. I stop with them. That is not that is not what I want to be like. Kyo Kai, true, honest way, and working together. So it, seemed, it was. It seemed, it's funny because you're talking about 1987. It seems like nothing changed because in 1975, Masoyama said, "Look, if the Japanese don't take first place, I'm going to kill myself." Yeah, yeah. And in 1979, he told Willie Williams, "If you win the semifinals, we're going to shoot you." Yeah. You know, and so it seems like nothing changed. No, no, because, and, and that's why the, the referees don't uh, want to do the favor for the foreigners in most of the cases. The Japanese have to win because that's, that's a shame, eh? They have sometimes. But I think, and there's real Kikushin, I think, if you win, you win. You, you Maybe you have your lucky day and I have a bad day, but if you're a winner, you know what, as, as everybody knows, it's who is really fighting Kikushin. After tournament, Everybody embraces each other and drink a beer. That's the way it should be. And okay, you win this time. Maybe next time I will win, but not by uh, incompetent referees. I agree 100%. And it's also very frustrating when someone trains for six months or four years and they put all that work. And if you notice the draw, they'll take two tough Europeans, put them in the first round. And then the people they want to win have very easy fights. Yeah, yeah. At the time these guys are getting to their fourth fight, they're all banged up. That's true. I remember uh, Andy Hug when he fought in the finals against Matsui. Yeah. His legs were destroyed. How, how was he supposed to walk into that fight? I, I know we were in the dressing room with him, and he wanted to stop before that final. And we, the Dutch, talked to him 10 minutes from Andy, this is your chance. This is the only one chance you have to be them, do it. But you never can win because I also have my last fight against a Japanese guy, Koi. And um, I had three referees on the corner and the head referee was also Japanese. So, you know, you have to kill them. Otherwise you lose. It was like um, also in that same year, I think it was the semifinals when it was Matsui against Michael Thompson. And really, I thought I thought Michael Thompson won on points yeah. the second yeah. round or whatever, yeah. but they yeah. keep having extension, extension, extension. So I felt bad for Michael Thompson. But yeah, anyway. that's true. But you have, it happens everywhere, also in Holland or in, in England. We have the same. But the, the, the draw in Japanese uh, competition 
is really, really corrupt. Well, it's interesting. I, I actually, in 1992, you were there. It was Atlanta, 1992. And I fought one of your fighters, uh, Lunt. Iwan Lunt, I think. Iwan Lunt, yeah, yeah. And uh, we had a good fight. I thought it was maybe a draw, but it was in America. So <clears throat> the referee gave me the decision. Yeah. And Lunt looked at me and I looked at him. We both yeah. knew this is the draw. We need, a, we need a fight again. Yeah. But... And I that's do? that's it. The fighters know. The yeah. fighters know. Everybody knows. Hey, I'm the winner. Or hey, I don't win today. Because the fighters remember, know exactly. Because in the fight, he was low. Man, I couldn't. I couldn't block his low kicks. And I'm good at blocking low kicks. Yeah. <laughs> he was too tricky. Yeah. But I I kicked him in the head. I need him in the face. So I said, okay, well, good. It's about even. Yeah. And then, but they gave me the decision. So anyway, yeah, yeah. sorry to you online. Anyway. Yeah. Um, then how did you, of course, how did you, in around 1990, how did you determine to join Oyama Karate officially? How did that happen? I don't know exactly how that happened. It was uh, circumstances of our path crosses each other. I don't know exactly. But uh, I do know that the name Shigeru Oyama, Sosai, yeah. And then later we heard uh, the story about the family Oyama who adopted uh, the big Matsutatsu Oyama. Mm -hmm. So that was a kind of natural um, feeling that we have, probably, to uh, to join him. And I must say, uh, um, we liked it, no problem. Well, Therefore, we, we came to, twice a year to the United States. You know, it's interesting, a little uh, interesting history that you, you may not know, but you may know. In let's say 1988, 1989, excuse me, 1988, 1989, those years, whenever there was Oyama Karate Tournament in New York, Atlanta, wherever they were, Alabama, usually the Uchideshi from Japan, from either New York or Alabama or maybe Chicago, they always beat everybody. Or maybe maybe some fighters like me would win. Then in, ninth, in October 1990, I think it was October 1990, was the first time your team came over. And they, they beat the shit out of everybody. They killed everybody. And I think it was a wake-up call for Oyama Karate. They go, man, because all the Japanese guys and guys like me beating everybody. And then when your team came, you killed everybody. So, <laughs> um, yeah, anyway, so... First of all, I'll give you an example. Like the, we we always learned a very straight fighting, like left, right, right low kick. But you guys it was like right straight, left hook, right look. Like we never saw that before. Um, also, we didn't really understand the liver punch. I remember when I fought Kenneth Felter, your student, for the first time. Uh, I lost decision to him. And I saw him after in the locker room. I said, what is over here? What are you, what are you punching me over here? What, what, what do you keep punching this? I didn't even know what that was. He said, oh, that's the liver. I said, I don't know what the liver is. <laughs> so so my, my question is, how did you guys have such an advanced, advanced fighting system? Because, of course, we punch hard. We kick hard. We have good stamina. Our bodies can take a lot. That's no problem. But... The, the the technology, if I can use that word, the advancement in your level of fighting was like uh, uh, 10 times ahead of us. So where did you guys learn this or pick this up or figure this out? Yeah, it, it is the, especially the last uh, uh, word, figure it out. Because uh, when we train, we do, all, of course, the key on the basic we do the kata, but also kumite, the fighting. And during the fighting, we because we have a big, strong group, we can help each other to level up. And there we find out things that we have to do different than the regular Japanese, because they are doing still the same until this day. And we, the Dutch in general, are just thinking about, hey, how can we improve that? Why do we do that? That doesn't make sense. That is maybe better. And then uh, try it out in real time. And then we find out that we do uh, uh, the, the contra techniques. 
So like uh, you finish with the right hook or punch, therefore we come with the left kick and vice versa. So that's where then because one punch with the right and the same right kick, it is nice. But if you do the contra movement, it's feeling stronger and it is stronger. So and, and therefore we also do uh, some kickboxing combination of with karate. And also in our free time after the regular training on Saturday, we took up our gloves and we go on to the ground like do you, you do now, the BGG. And in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu doesn't exist 50 years ago, but we are uh, doing stuff on the ground. And so we developed uh, some yeah, new things, so to speak. But in, in the fighting, it was, uh, yeah, uh, not do, especially not doing what the Japanese are doing because that is just too straight and we want to, to be the inventor, so to speak. Excellent. And, and on that note, just we'll come back to karate in a second, but if you look at like 1993 when K1 starts and you have guys like <clears throat> Peter Arts, Ernesto Hust, all these great Dutch fighters beating everybody, um, with a similar, I mean, you, uh, you know, Ernesto who's bang, bang, left hook, right, low kick. Yeah. Um, and of course, the most of the gyms, Voss gym, Majero gym, th- th- these guys were Kyokushin guys at some point, and then they kind of mixed it with Thai boxing. Yeah. Um, were you also looking at kind of what their techniques were and bringing them to karate, or maybe it was the other way? They were looking at your techniques and brought it to kickboxing. I think it's a it's a fifty fifty uh, because uh, as you say uh, a lot of uh, that time the, the beginners of uh, K one were kickboxing but also had the, indeed the background of karate or sometimes taekwondo and they use it with gloves on it so I, I think um, uh, we used to uh, see also a lot of uh, tournaments in kickboxing galas uh, mostly in Amsterdam two big uh, dojos fighting each other. And uh, we saw that also some things that we can, hey, maybe we can do that, implement in our thing. You have to be ready for that because I can uh, do uh, uh, three times flip over and jump five meters, but I cannot do that because I'm two meters and under 20 kilos. But for some students of me who are very light guys, 60, 65 kilos, they can do that kind of stuff maybe if they were able to do it. So we, we pick, let's say, the, the good things that we might use in our system, so to speak. So it, it, has, it depends on your uh, uh, physical, of course. Okay, let me, let me ask you just some random random questions around, yeah. uh, around these subjects. These are just random questions that I'd love your opinion on. Question number one, when Francisco Filio knocked out Andy Hug in the... World Open. Obviously, I've watched that. The whistle blew. The it was the whistle blew, and after the whistle blew, Francisco Filio's foot was still on the ground. It wasn't like his foot was in the middle. It was on the ground. He knocked an Andy hook. Now, someone could say, "Well, Andy, you got to keep your hands up the whole time. You you can't rely on split second whatever." But someone could also say that's not fair because the whistle did blow when his foot was still on the ground. So. What is your opinion of that whole episode? I say, because I also uh, am a referee, although not, not everybody invites me as a referee because I'm too straight. Right. <laughs> too, fair. too fair. Yeah, too fair. But I always say to, also to my students, but uh, before a tournament, uh, I speak to the fighters and the coaches, you stop when the head referee says stop. Yame. Until that, you go on. Even if four people are blowing their whistles and waving their flags, I'm the, the boss in the, on the tatami in the ring. If I say stop, you stop directly. And if somebody uh, uh, is not capable of defending himself, it's my job to, to take care of his health and to stop the fight and jump in, uh, in between them when necessary. Okay. Excellent. N- next question. Like I said, just random. Um, Rob came in. What made him so good? He was just amazing, amazing, amazing. What What made him so good? Yeah, 
there comes again the, 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 the Dutch mentality about uh, finding out what suits you the best and uh, make that your forte, your strong point. And everybody, every fighter has his weak points. But you, you make a camouflage and uh, expose, of course, the, the, the good things you are good at. So uh, and that is what he also uses a lot, the contra movement. And that is typical for uh, the Dutch uh, kickboxing, but also in general, the Dutch karateka. Okay, another another random question. And I brought up Peter Arts before, but Peter Arts looks a little clumsy. He has a very awkward, he's almost falling forward when he's walking. He's almost like falling. Yeah. His punches, his right punch looks like this. It's like, it's not really a punch. Straight one. Right, right. So, so nonetheless, he's one of the best kickboxers, you know, in re- that we're aware of ever. You know, what? What? Is, I mean, I, he he appears to kick very, very hard, yeah. but still a little awkward. So, I'm just wondering, what do you think is one of the secrets to his success? Yeah, he is uh, indeed clumsy to see. He's not a, a, a clean fighter, but it is a real fight, and he was very close with uh, Peter Smith. They were close yeah. friends. They 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 train together. They go out together, so they know each other very much. So they learned and helped each other also. I think with the style of fighting, but but Peter Arch is uh, yeah is a strong guy, and also it doesn't matter if they beat him up. I don't give a fuck. I go. You know, it's funny about like that. There's a great fight. You probably saw it. And you were talking about the mental aspect and Peter Smith and Peter Arts. I remember this very subtle, but a fighter can see this. I'm sure you could see it. There was a fight in K1 many years ago. It was Peter Arts versus Ernesto Hust. Of course, they fought many times. But this particular fight, they kept having overtime, 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 no, extra round, extra round. So there was a point, it was already, maybe they fought four rounds. And they're standing there. And, you know, the judge is about to lift a hand. But they speak in Japanese, of course. And they say, draw. One more round. And they had the camera on Ernesto Houston. He was like. And Peter, <laughs> and, and Peter, 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 Peter Arthur was like. Well, he, just, I don't. He, looked, he looked like he was standing on line at the store to buy milk. He, yeah. Okay. No. And then, of course, he came and won. Yeah. yeah. But that, that is this. That is, that is really use your brain because if you show to the other your opponent that you are dead, then you lose. But if you can say an attitude from I don't care, six rounds, seven rounds, then that's a mental mental question. And that was Peter Hart and Peter Smith very good at it. Well, it's it's, it. You know, it's interesting. I think almost the opposite. I'm going to mention another fighter, a very good fighter, not a Dutch fighter, but uh, Mirko Krokop, who of course was a K1 fighter and then a yeah. MMA fighter. Of course, he's great. Of course, he's yeah. amazing. Amazing. But his he always looked like he didn't want to be in there. To me, he looked like he just waiting. For, he, even when the fight started, he didn't want to stand there, and he just wanted to do whatever he could to get out. Of course, yeah, as soon as possible. Right. Of course, of course, he wants to win. Yeah. But I think his physical talent took him high. Yeah. But I think his mental was. Not the greatest. Yeah, yeah. And, and that is what I also say to uh, all students who come uh, uh, in the dojo where I train now the last 15 years here and uh, because I moved to the northeast of Holland. I say, uh, it doesn't matter what you do, keep on saying, keep on fighting and show no mercy, but also try not to show that you are hurt. Because I see in tournaments, people, when they get a low kick or a lever punch, you see the face then you know you lose. Don't show anything. Don't show anything. But that's difficult, of course. You get to have to get used to it. But yeah. it's, it's 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 getting used to it. If you train, 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 and then maybe you can make a little uh, show like Peter Smith, because Peter Smith, of course, he felt also the punches and the kicks. Of course, it's a human being. But he was in that case. He was very strong, like Rob Kaman and some other guys who are very strong by not showing that you are hurt. Exactly. Now, when it comes to the UFC, UFC won again, 1993, your brother got to the finals. 
Yeah. Of course, there's all kinds of problems that day. He has the he he kicks the sumo guy because the fence is close, so he can't really kick with his shin. He has to kick yeah. with his foot, and then he gets the tooth in his foot, and then the hook punch to finish. He hurts his hand, and he has to have more fights. So it was a, it was a, a lot of problems to, yeah. to get through that tournament. But um, what what are, what are your thoughts on that first UFC? Well, it it was of course uh, a trial. Uh, first uh, try out and did not have any rules and let uh, uh, the champion of the several martial arts uh, to do their thing. But uh, my brother trained a uh, very short time, the groundwork, because we are not used to it. We are stand-up fighters. And crazy was, of course, he is sleeping in, uh, on the ground, so to speak. So uh, in that case, it was uh, difficult, but nice to see. But it is not... Uh, a competition I do like because there are no rules at all. Because uh, I can think you can beat each other up, but there have to be a certain level of uh, yeah humanity or whatever you want to call it. Um, it was yeah almost a brawl, a street fight, and uh, for the audience uh, it, it, it was super. It was uh, immense. But nowadays at the, the regular fights in MMA and so on are more strict. They're bloody and hard fighting and phew, they're real uh, real strong fighters. But they're, now the referee can jump in and say, hey, it's over. So that's okay. better. Also, just uh, going back, going kind of back in time a little bit, just a couple of a couple of your fighters that I either fought or I watched fight, I just wanted to get your opinion on them because some of the best about your training methods with them or why they were so good. So the first one is Kenneth, of course, Kenneth Felter, who I, I fought three times, very tough guy. Yeah. Um, what what set him apart? How, how was he so good? Because I I think he had the hardest low kick I ever felt. Uh, probably, and that is uh, technique training, of course. But he is also um, a very clever guy, and he could uh, read his opponent, and that's very important because a lot of people, uh, let's say eighty uh, percent. It's just uh, beating up, punches and kicking, and uh, okay, it's over. I'm the winner. But he was very clever, and he was just taking his shots whenever he can. So he was, we call him a very lazy guy, uh, because he's uh, from uh, origin Suriname, and we make all this joke. They are very lazy guys. And that's what he, he does, doesn't do a thing too much. Just he does what he needs to do to win. And then he was uh, ready, and he was tall guy, long arms, long legs, and technique, technically uh, gifted. Okay. How about um, another fighter who was in my era, but he was too light for me to fight, so I just watched him, but I, I always was very impressed, was uh, Muhammad Hakim. Hakim, yeah. yeah. What, what, what was his uh, secret? He was very, very good. He had great combinations. He was very hard to hurt. He punched hard. He kicked hard. He had great stamina. Yeah, and he, yeah he was. He was. I call it him a real killer. I mean, if he uh, was listed in a, some kind of a criminal uh, organization, he would be the hitman. He was unbelievably tough with training, and um, you know, I'm bigger and uh, heavier, but uh, I always train with the guys. Uh, because I think uh, if you are a teacher, you have to stand with your feet on the ground, literally. And then I say, I kick him, I punch it, but he never gave in. But that, that's for all the students I have. So uh, I think that was also nice for me to see that they grow and can, became better and harder and technical and they're smarter with fighting. So we also have some, uh, how you call it, uh, tricks. Uh, that we say uh, no, call numbers, and for instance, the liver we called forty-two, because forty-two in a Chinese restaurant was liver. So that was because if you say person on the liver, everybody can hear you, right? Or uh, do a right low kick, yeah. Hey, big secret. <laughs> so we work with numbers and uh, some secret uh, words. So, uh, but it, it was a really tough, really tough guy. How about um? Another fighter of yours I wanted to ask you about. How about uh, Murat Agar? Murat Agar is uh, the same style, a real uh, strong guy, 
And we came with our dojo uh, as a guy from, I think, 12 years. And he was so strong. I say he has the hardest punch, the hardest punch. It was uh, a block of granite. It was unbelievable. Very nice guy. All the guys were nice. But, uh, yeah, it, it, it was also a very good fighter. And uh, sometimes he was also with the, the, the corrupt uh, referees. He lose fighters, fights. And uh, we have had in, in Germany they, they to fight each other. Hakim against Agar. First round. I go to the organization. They say, I, they are from the same country, but no, we make it bigger. They say, Dojo, put him to the left of the schedule and put him on the right on the schedule. And then we see tonight what will happen. No, 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 no. Not, not possible. Okay, not possible. Then we go. We leave. Yeah, smart. Yeah. Um, and um, let me ask you um, about some of the training methods. We already had mentioned, we already had mentioned that, uh, you know, you were figuring stuff out. We talked about some of the different uh, techniques, but what were some of the other training methods you think at your dojo, at Kamakura, that set you guys apart? Because obviously to produce athletes like that, something was going on in that dojo, which most were not doing. Yeah, uh, first thing is always important to be uh, on every training and on time, of course. If you are too late, you get punished. Old school, I know, but I still do that. It's our dead time. You have to be there in time. Train every training. And we also do a lot of uh, uh, fighting, of course. I, I told you before, uh, always uh, eight, ten rounds. Uh, to conclude the, the lesson, st standard, always. And we do also um, stamina training with uh, the pads and the cushions. So we have to kick for, uh, like, uh, Michael Jackson, beat it, the number, just on that rhythm, make the kicks. So it takes uh, maybe uh, eight minutes. We do that kind of stuff also. And punching on the, the punching back and then make... Uh, uh, easy technical training, but also have sometimes three minutes, full force, 100%, until you're throwing up or you let your uh, urine go yeah, but because you're tired so much. Just to go to the, the deepest point, and then you know I can survive anything. So this is mental, mental. Okay. My next question is about this. When, when people learn life lessons, I'm not talking martial arts, lessons for their life to be, you know, happy and healthy and successful in their life. M many people have different paths to that. Some people like philosophy. They read philosophy books. Some people are religious. They have a religion they'd like to follow. Uh, some people, you know, maybe their parents had a big influence on them or whatever. But in martial arts, it's very common, very common for probably thousands of years in martial arts to take the lessons of training and then apply it to someone's life. And, it, uh, you know, presumably that can help them be happier and healthier and more successful. If you one day wrote a book, not even about technique, forgetting all the techniques, but if you wrote a book about all the life lessons that you've learned and, and that you've taught and that you've observed, what are some of the, if you have to talk about some of the life lessons you've learned in the dojo that can help people what, what would they be? Yeah, it's, it's an old one, never give up. But that's... That's a good one. That's a good, that's a good one. But uh, uh, loyalty is important. Uh, to be honest and integrity. Because I've also met a lot of people. We gave everything, learned everything, and then they fly away to another dojo. It is not uh, bad if you uh, agree to each other that. Because, hey, Sensei, I want to train also there. I say, please do be my guest, but not at the back of me. So that's very important. And as all, you get older, you get a lot of people making uh, disadvantages of you. And uh, they, they use you. And th th that's a pity. Because I have a lot of uh, karate people in Holland. I speak now from my country. And... Uh, they never uh, invite you. They never talk to you. 
behind your back. And then when they see you on the tournament now and then, they are friendly in your face. But you know, behind your back, they're talking. But when when you over the years, I'm I'm, I'm sure what I'm going to mention now has happened hundreds of times. Over the years, a student comes to you and says, you know, sensei or hanchi or, you know, they say to you, they're having a problem, whatever, a personal problem, whatever it is, they're having a yeah. rough time in their life. Maybe, you know, maybe, I don't know, maybe they're drinking alcohol and they can't stop drinking or maybe they have a problem with uh, drugs, whatever, or, or even just they're depressed or whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I'm sure, obviously, you look what's in front of you and you deal with what's in front of you and everyone is different. But what are some of the principles that you can have them appeal to say, hey, you know, you're training here, you already are experiencing ABC. What are some of the principles that you can remind them of from the training they're doing with you to help them? Uh, as you know, the training is uh, always, no, not always, but most of the time hard. So that is uh, uh, hopefully toughen you up for real life. And if somebody is uh, having trouble, I say, I have also had and have troubles. And I'm uh, almost 70, so uh, don't make a really big deal. Deal with it, fight it. And uh, uh, I have uh, recently a guy who was smoking so much, yeah, cigarettes, not uh, wheat or something. Mm. But uh, you want to stop. I said, I, I hear you talking about stopping already for four years. Stop. Yeah, it's difficult. I said, I know because I smoked. When I was young, I smoked also, but I stopped because, you know, it's not good. But yeah, I, I try to, to to make them stronger, to fight their problem, whatever it is. And I always say, uh, come train. If you, It is only two or three times a week. Eh? It is not a real uh, uh, fighting level, but general. I said, you have other days to do your other things. So, but, but know that you have to be uh, uh, ready for your body, to take care of your body, but also here. So... Don't uh, find an excuse to not train. Train, train. Because, yeah, I have to do this. Yeah, Do you think I don't have uh, something to do? Uh, no, normally, I have a working life. I'm not retired. But I have to go uh, to my uh, work every day, five days a week. Besides that, I do the training. So what are your, your problems then? No, no big deal. Got it. Um... Another another figure of uh, Dutch martial arts I wanted to ask you about is John Blooming. And I wanted to ask you about him for two reasons. One is I think that at some point um, when he was alive, you, you were affiliated with him. That's number one. And number two, I read his uh, autobiography. He, I don't know if you ever saw it. He wrote, a, he wrote an autobiography. It was half in Dutch, half in English. So, of course, I read the English part. I mean, I mean, the whole thing, in other words, the whole book, he just had it side by side, the whole book in Dutch, whole book in English. It was put together. It's a, it's a nice book. So he said in the book, he said, he said, look, he said, I'm great at judo. Of course I can throw people. I'm also good at, you know, stand up. And he said, of course, I love Masoyama. He was my teacher. He was like my father. I respected him. But he said, look, if, if, if you want to know, he said in a real fight, of course, I would just take him down and beat him up, you know? what he said, which is fine. I, I don't care about that. He, whatever. But my question is when you were training with him, affiliated with him or with him in some way, did he kind of push the judo on you? Did he say, Hey, he said, look, you're great at karate. I want, I want to teach you more judo. Or he just didn't really go in that conversation. He was happy with what you're doing and that's it. Now, he was, uh, at the moment, we have been uh, affiliated and working together with him not so long, short time, because um, his main issue is always money, more than the sport. He is, uh, from our origin, he was uh, judo, and he did a lot of ground fight, because the standing fight, he cannot, uh, cannot teach us. He cannot teach us, because we were way higher level than he. doesn't matter. And we told him, uh, you stay there as a big Sosai, uh, uh, or whatever, and uh, let us, my brothers and me, and uh, some other guys, let us work for you and do the, the work. And you just sit there as the big guy. But he was uh, uh, too much influ influence for himself to, to give the training. 
but nine out of ten times it was on the ground, the judo techniques. Nothing wrong with that, but we are karateka. So it is okay to have a part uh, like you do uh, with the Brazilian jiu-jitsu. Combine that with karate, super. Great. Um, just in general, I wanted to ask you about eating, you know, diet and exercise. Now, there's two groups. One group would be a fighter. Like you might have a fighter who you're training and you're advising them on how to eat a little bit. And of course, obviously exercise because they're training with you. The other group is just people, they, just people in this world who want to say, hey, I want to be healthier. Can you, can you tell me a good way to eat? I, I, don't know, I don't know how to eat and I don't really know how to exercise. Should I exercise seven days a week or three days a week or every other day? Or should I do yoga? Should I stretch? Should I jog? Should I lift weights? Uh, so I'm just curious, what are your thoughts on diet and exercise for the fighter and for the general population? Now, with the, the, the diet, the food, I don't know um, much about it. Let's say uh, nothing. Uh, but I can advise you to go to that guy or that girl who can advise you if you want to have another style of living and eating. And uh, the general people are just, they just train and they don't need a special diet, just regular food, what they do normally. But the, the, the real fighters, let's say the, the top guys, uh, I don't advise them about uh, diet because I don't know it. But I uh, say you go to that people, they can advise you. Got it. And then how about just one more thing about that? The general population, not a, not a fighter, just someone who says, hey, I just want to be healthy. Forget, forget food, but exercise. Do you, because maybe not everyone is going to do martial arts. Do you think it's good to take long walks or to stretch or do you, what, what do you think is just a good way to exercise the body in general? Now, because I'm uh, myself, I'm not, uh, I'm a really stiff guy. So I always uh, do the exercise to, to get a little bit more flexible. Uh, uh, I don't like running because I'm a big guy. It's not good for my knees and my ankles. By the way, Brendan helps me very good with my ankle. He's the best. A really guy. He's the best. Uh, He's the best. But it, it has to shoot you because uh, a lot of people um, go swimming if that helps people to feel uh, physically and mentally better, it's okay. It's, a, it's okay. But uh, of course, I want to, to drag them in for their martial arts. It's the same way like the kickboxing guys in the dojo uh, who train there in Sri uh, And I say, you try a little uh, karate. Yeah, 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 I will. Uh, and next month I will. I said, okay, okay, okay. They never show up. Uh, so, some guys are doing, they're doing kickboxing and karate and vice versa. So, they make a good uh, combination. Let, let me ask you this. In, in martial arts, in Aikido, and I know we're not experts on Aikido, but there's an, there's an idea in Aikido, an idea that if the force is coming this way, not to collide with it. They, they, like the, the force is going this way. Yeah. Not, don't collide. Just, Go just away. join the force somehow. Yeah. yeah. Now, yeah. That's it. Now, there are certain martial arts, I, I don't know what one, but there's certain martial arts, it's just pure collision. The yeah, force yeah. is coming this way, we're just going to collide, we're going to see who's stronger. Yeah. So my question for you, obviously, you're not teaching Aikido, obviously, but even in uh, hard fighting like karate or kickboxing, there must be some notion or idea yeah. of being aware of this other person's energy and um, adapting to it in some way. So what are your thoughts kind of on that topic as a martial arts teacher? That's what uh, we have uh, talked before with uh, Kenneth Felter. He was a kind guy. He's going with, with the force and he's using uh, like an Aikido way of fighting because if you like bunching together, you get a big collision. But it's better, but that is also the experience. If you fight, uh, maybe the first time, for the first times, you do that. But then you wake up and hey, every time I have injuries and it is broken, it is bru bruised and everything. So then you get to know that, hey, maybe sometimes I go a little with him or around him 
and then attack him from the other side. Because uh, I teach also the guys because I am right-handed, but I uh, fight always uh, like south pole. Always. So I, I force them to do the techniques, the kion, and the fighting. And I give them a certain uh, 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 things to do. Uh, you have to do, and you only have to stay right foot front, so like a southpaw, and now fight. Not allowed to stay in your left foot front, because there's other way. And also, because if you're fighting a uh, southpaw, some people are getting confused because they are used to somebody who is left hand front. And if you stay the other way, some people get confused. So that's a little point in advance during your fight. My last question before we wrap up is when it comes to mindset, we talked about mindset a few times today. When it comes to mindset, well, sometimes you have a fighter who's about to fight, they're about to step and fight, and you might remind them or say, you know, you might say something to them just to for their mind before they fight. And then just a general person, when they wake up in the morning, they have a mindset. They 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 wake up, they open their eyes, they have to stand out of bed, they're they're going to start their day with some mindset. So my my final question of this interview is, what is something that you, you know, tell a fighter right before they step in to fight? And what is something that you would advise the general population when they wake up in the morning? What's a good mindset for the day? Yeah, always try to be positive despite a lot of negative we have in the world as today. But uh, when I uh, fighting, I was... Um, I used to wear glasses in the old days. Uh, 15 years ago, I lasered them. But in that day, without the glasses, I couldn't see anything. So I took them off. So therefore, you have to do this. And then four days, not shaving. And I was looking like this. Everybody was thinking, oh, he is mad. He's crazy. He's angry. But I couldn't see anything unless I stand one meter from you. So that was uh, an attitude to try to disable the, the, the opponent <laughs> but in general i i should say uh, uh like you have nowadays in the the, the big fights in uh, um, kickboxing tournaments they have to the, the face off i think there's too much they, they're looking so angry sometimes they were fighting do that in the ring that's my advice just uh, uh go to each other with respect and of course, you want to beat you. I want to beat you, but I can be respectful. And that is the biggest lesson I've learned in Kikushin. I like that. Listen, <clears throat> thank you so much. I'm welcome. First of all, super happy we connected. I do plan to teach a healing seminar in Netherlands. And of course, I'll see you, obviously. And sure. thanks for this. And um, I think a lot of people will benefit from it. I hope so. Thank you for having me. And uh, well, I hope to see and talk to each other uh, sometime more. 100%.